Can you describe the dynamic between Jennifer and the children? Yeah, it was very silly, her relationship with the kids. Um, they always wanted to be next to mommy. It was just kind of what it was. And she would sing to them and laugh at them. And she never raised her voice. She so was like so soft-spoken and never got angry. And um, she was just like incredibly nurturing. The body of Jennifer Dulos has yet to be found. The family's nanny, though, is back on the stand this morning. We've got a preview for you of the day ahead. And a trial date has been set for boy in the box mom, Tracy Ferrer. Will she have a different outcome than her husband? And will this photo with a case victim tip the scales of justice in favor of defendant Ty Tucker. We'll talk about the Treehouse murder trial. It's all coming up next for you right here on Opening Statements. Good Wednesday morning to you. Thanks so much for waking up with us here on Opening Statements. I'm Julie Grant, your host, and welcome to the show if you're brand new. No matter where you're watching, if it's in the United States or across the globe, we are just so thrilled you are here. And we think that you'll find this show a lot like the actual opening statements at trial. That's what we did when we created it. We want to have something to get you all primed and ready to go, warmed up for the big day of Court TV Live Ahead, for all the major cases at trial that we broadcast, and then and all the big cases in the world of true crime that we cover. So right now, it's time for you to grab a cup of coffee because it's time for my opening statement. You can't judge a book by its cover. That old saying proves to be true time and time again, doesn't it? We see it quite often with criminal defendants too, don't we? They're accused of heinous crimes, but they look like a nice person. Oh, my friends, there's a big case out of Cincinnati, Ohio, that's making headlines for this very reason, and it's making me mad. Look at this woman. So this is Lisa Nacrelli, and she doesn't really look threatening, does she? You know, and, and when she approached a little boy in Ohio to try to lure him from his family home, family home, police say, she wasn't carrying any weapons, she didn't appear angry, no, uh, what she did was gently approached the child, gently touched him, started stroking his hair, tried to convince him to go home with her. And thank goodness that little boy, this is the video, you see it right here. Thank goodness that little boy trusted his gut and he ran inside the house and he told his mom and his dad what this stranger did. What's more, Police say Lisa Nacrelli goes as far as to show the family a fake badge claiming that she's a CPS worker. The family, thank goodness, alerted police and this doorbell camera video you're looking at helped them identify her. Look at her, doesn't look too threatening, right? Police say Nacrelli was living down the street from this family. So I wonder, my friends, who knows how many times this lady might have been watching that little boy or the family's patterns if what police say about her attempted abduction is true. And what might she have done to that sweet little boy if he did go home with her, if those allegations are true? Child predators are the scum of the earth. They are dangerous people, and they frequently disguise themselves as decent, harmless people. Look at this guy. You know who this is? When I was a little girl, Ted Bundy's the example that my mother used to teach me how you can't judge a book by its cover. And if I were a parent today, I would show my kids the Lisa Nacrelli video and talk about what a great job that little boy did in running to his parents, trusting his gut. You know, all too often in these cases, my friends, you know it, the cases we cover oftentimes of child victims don't make it out alive when they are abducted. So thank goodness that four-year-old is alive and well this morning, and we can all learn from this story. And we will see. What happens when Lisa Nacrelli is back in court today? And you will get to see all of her hearing today on court TV. Yes, she is cloaked in the presumption of innocence. I also believe that people who prey on innocent, sweet children should receive the harshest of punishments. That's my opening statement on this Wednesday morning. Let me know if you like it right now. I want to give you what's on your daily docket. 
the figures in those Cosme videos match the general dis descriptions of the suspects that you had in this case? Absolutely. Between what uh, John Travis Johnson told us in his confession, after what um, Roger Ruggett told us in his interview about what happened based on Paula's absolute identification of the gentleman that she knew by the street name of Detroit, who was later learned to be Rory Wilson. All right, friends, here's a look at some of the cases we've got for you today on Court TV Live. Testimony set to resume at 9 a.m. Eastern time in the Treehouse murder trial. Co-defendant Travis Johnson could be taking the stand in the state's case. And the state tells us they expect to rest on Thursday. So we'll see what happens when it is the pro se defendant's turn. In Connecticut, testimony is set to pick back up in the missing mom conspiracy trial. That is the trial over the death of Jennifer Dulos. The defendant is Michelle Traconis. She was the other woman. The direct examination of Jennifer Dulos's nanny is so key and she was leaving off starting you know with the discussion with how she learned about the affair that photos Dulos was happening and so they're going to pick back up at 10 a.m eastern time with that we'll have it for you live then at 1 p.m eastern hannah gutierrez is set to be in court to have a status hearing uh, she was the armorer on the rust movie shooting set and she's facing criminal charges so we'll have that for you as well court tv as always has boots on the ground for you across the country We've got Kelly Kraft in Stamford, Connecticut, and Matt Johnson in Columbia, South Carolina. We begin in Connecticut, where legal correspondent Kelly Kraft has the very latest on the missing mom conspiracy trial. Kelly. Well, good morning, Julie. Day four of testimony in the case against Michelle Traconis will get underway shortly here in Stamford, Connecticut. On the stand for the state first this morning will be the nanny, the longtime nanny of Jennifer Dulos. They always wanted to be next to mommy. It was just kind of what it was. She was just like incredibly nurturing. At first, Jennifer Dulos and husband Photos Dulos were nice to one another, said the nanny. But things changed when Jennifer found out her husband was having an affair. She told me she believed that Photos was having an affair. At that time, I had a good relationship with Photos, and I believed him to be an honest guy. And I couldn't imagine him having an affair where there's five little kids involved. Defendant Michelle Traconis was Photos Doulos' girlfriend. Prosecutors contend that she helped her boyfriend conceal his wife's murder. They showed the jury several photos of blood-like stains collected from the crime scene, the inside of a roll of paper towels, the faucet of the kitchen sink, below the sink, trash bags and latex gloves. The inside of the garage where prosecutors allege Photos murdered Jennifer was also shown to the jurors. Detective Riley testified about his testing of the evidence. Evidence. You perform the test uh, by taking a swab, taking some um, of the material, the suspect, the uh, suspected blood, onto the swab. Then you put a drop of the phenothaline on it, wait a couple of seconds. Then you uh, put a drop of the uh, hydrogen peroxide on it. And if you get an immediate color change, it'll turn a bright pink color. That's a positive test. And Julie testimony resumes here at 10 a.m. That's the latest from Stamford, Connecticut. Julie, we'll send it back to you. All right, our thanks to Kelly Kraft for that early update this morning. Now we want to take you to Columbia, South Carolina, where crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson has an update for us on Tuesday's hearing for Alec Murdoch. Julie, good morning. Big news out of South Carolina. The jurors and clerk of court Becky Hill will have to testify at the end of the month. Convicted killer Alec Murdoch back in court claiming the clerk of court Becky Hill influenced the jury in an effort to get a guilty verdict and sell copies of her book. On Tuesday, attorneys hashed out what the hearing will look like at the end of the month. Judge Newman will not be questioned and alternates might not either. At this point, only deliberating jurors will be questioned in open court along with clerk of court Becky Hill. Justice Toll made it clear that the hearing would focus on two things. What Becky Hill allegedly told the jurors and did it have an impact on their verdict? After the hearing, I spoke with both Joe McCullough and Eric Bland, attorneys who represent some of the jurors who will be subpoenaed to testify. 
Well, they're nervous. Um, you know, they gave seven months, uh, seven weeks of their life to this case, and now they're being asked to come back into court and talk about things that may have happened in the jury room that should be sacrosanct. Well, I think they're anxious. And, Julie, that hearing is scheduled for three days beginning January 29th here in Columbia, South Carolina. That's the very latest. I'll send it back to you in the studio. All right, thanks to Matt Johnson for that update this morning. And now we want to pick up where Matt left off and bring in someone who was in that courtroom who represents some of those jurors. He was kind enough to talk to Matt yesterday, and he's kind enough to join us on the show this morning. I want to welcome in attorney Eric Bland. Eric, good morning. Always great to have you on the program. So uh, I know there wasn't a lot of time for our crew to talk with you at length uh, yesterday, uh, and I was paying attention to what you were saying on Twitter and really liked the point you made about how the justice is really streamlining this to focus on the law and whether there was any kind of constitutional violation. Eric, tell us more, if you would, please. Sure. First, uh, good morning, and that was a great opening statement you made, and I agree with it. Oh, thank um, you, my friend. Yesterday, Julie, the defense got trucked. They, they walked in the court like bulls, and they left like lamb. Uh, they did not expect that Justice Toll would be following South Carolina law, which streamlines the judicial inquiry into whether a jury was tampered in only dealing with what was said to the jurors from an external factor, which is the clerk of court, and whether that had an impact on the jury. The defense walked in and said, we have the presumption and once we show that a statement was made to any juror, whether it was an alternative juror or a dismissed juror, the burden would shift to the def to the prosecution. Justice Toll said, no, the burden of proof is going to remain with you. You're going to have to show that there was prejudice by what Becky Hill allegedly said and that it had an impact on the jury. She is not going to let them, uh, uh, she's not going to interrogate anyone other than those 12 jurors that deliberated and Becky Hill. She is gonna do the deliberate, the interrogation herself. She will take some input from the, the defense and the prosecution. She will not let them participate. She even said that the proffer that they wanted to make, which is putting forth evidence and testimony for appellate purposes, she's not gonna let them do that in court. It'll be in writing. She does not want this to become a circus. Harputlian wanted this to be broad. He wanted to bring in uh, impeachment witnesses against Becky Hill. He wanted to bring in things that happened with Becky Hill regarding plagiarism, her son being charged, uh, the ethics complaints against her that postdated the jury verdict to attack her credibility. Justice Toll said, we're only going to deal with things that happened from the start of the trial to the end of the trial. The defense was frustrated. They left the courthouse angry. Uh, they gave five no comments to Matt uh, from Court TV, which is very unusual for Harputlian because he's never met a camera or a microphone that he wouldn't stop in front of. So it was a very bad day for the defense yesterday. Oh, yeah. Uh, Eric, uh, you're right. I, I love what Her Honor is doing here. And I was looking up Her Honor. Um, what an impressive woman she is. I mean, retired uh, Chief Justice of the South Carolina Supreme Court, as you know, the first woman to ever serve on that court. Uh, Eric, you, having practiced there in a long, uh, for quite some time in South Carolina, uh, have you um, ever been before her on any other matters at a trial court or in an yeah. appellate court? Um, what, it, what is she like? What is her reputation? Tell us a little bit more about her honor, if you would. Um, I have on um, both the trial level and appellate level. She is um, a towering intellect, uh, regarded as probably one of the most uh, brightest of intellectual justices that we've ever had on our Supreme Court. She went straight from the legislature to the Supreme Court. She was the first woman uh, female chief justice we ever had. She um, can run a very tight courtroom. It makes lawyers nervous and litigants nervous because she's an activist judge in terms of demanding precision on the law. Uh, yesterday, she corrected the uh, defense attorney, Jim Griffin, about the law. She knows the case backward and forward. She reads every single document. Uh, she will 
uh, cut the attorneys off, which makes attorneys anxious. If there's anything that can be criticized uh, of her, it's sometimes she gets frustrated with uh, attorneys and litigants because she is so smart. Um, she's 80, over 80 years old and has a full-time schedule, even though she's a retired judge. In our state system, you have to retire off the Supreme Court at 72 years old. So she went from the Supreme Court back to the trial court and she's handling uh, asbestos uh, litigation class action cases right now, which are very difficult to, to handle. And wow. she just is uh, an amazing litigant amazing intellect and she was a litigator for 20 years before she went in the legislature so she knows what goes on in a courtroom certainly she's she's been in the trenches as we like to say right uh, you know those but you always can spot a trial attorney you know if somebody has been in the trenches or not and uh, what an illustrious career uh, eric tell me something else her honor is doing is protecting the jurors and uh, protecting their anonymity i know that has been paramount you know in terms of the concerns that you have uh, as someone who's representing uh, numerous jurors here uh, would you talk to me about how you felt after hearing sure. the way the judge was going to handle this yeah i spoke yesterday uh, at the end she asked me you know what i wanted from my four jurors that i represent and i said look my job was to preserve their anonymity make sure that they're not harassed by the public and that their verdict that they rendered by their conscience be preserved. And that would have been if it was a not guilty verdict. That would be my job, not to impose what I thought of Alex's guilt, which I believe he was guilty. And I suggested to the judge, because their juror numbers have been published in different uh, media, whether it's been in newspaper, because emails have been released, we should renumber the jurors one through 12. She agreed with that. She is not going to let them testify in camera, which means in chambers, it's going to be an open court, but she is uh, forbidding the media to photograph them, videotape them, and there will, they will only, uh, the public will only hear their voices. They're going to be picked up from their house by our state law enforcement division and transported to court. They're gonna come in through a private entrance and they're not gonna sit in the jury box. She's gonna do everything possible to uh, preserve their anonymity and make sure it's as seamless as possible. And she said, she's gonna question all 12 jurors on the first day Monday, January 29th, and she will be done with them Monday the 29th. That is great. And there won't be any cross-examination, by the way, oh, okay. of the defense attorneys and the prosecution. Oh, it's interesting. The court will handle it all. Uh, wow. Uh, what, what, a, what a tremendous yes. justice she is. Uh, this is going to be very fair for all parties. Uh, Eric, thank you for all of that. One last question, please, before we let you go. Uh, Matt was telling me, I was asking, I saw some, some faces in the gallery um, that were interesting, people not really connected to the case who might have been sitting there. Um, he saw Sandy Smith sitting there, uh, your client Sandy Smith, uh, Stephen Smith's mom, of course, our, our viewers are, are hoping for justice for her and her family. Um, can you tell us uh, why she was there? She wants to let the world know and the state of South Carolina to know that she's there, she's present, and she's always going to be there and that they cannot forget about her. The problem is that Alex steals so much of the oxygen from the court system and our state law enforcement division. And Sandy wanted to be there and uh, she will be there on the 29th. This is a dedicated mother, Julie. Oh, she sure is. God bless her. I, I can't think of anything worse uh, than to bury a child. Our hearts go out to her, Eric. And I know you'll keep us posted if there's any developments there with that case. Uh, Eric, please come back again soon. I was saying to my producer, we're going to have you on for analysis one day uh, when we're not talking about one of the cases you just handled. Let you sleep and focus on someone else's case uh, for once. Uh, thank you kindly, Eric. Thank you for having me on. Of course. And here's what's coming up next, my friends, here on Opening Statements. To me, being locked in a room, it's dehumanizing. It's almost as bad as genocide. It's saddening to abuse a child that was just acting like a child. Tim Ferrett are behind bars for crimes involving locking his adopted son up in a box in the garage. And now his wife, Tracy, she's going to trial soon on similar charges. So what does her new trial date mean for the case? It's not happening as soon as prosecutors would have liked it to. 
And Rex Hewerman now charged with a fourth murder in connection to the Gilgo Beach murder case. We're spotlighting how DNA has become key to the prosecution's case against the alleged killer. Did a contentious divorce lead to a killing? Jennifer Dulos vanished in 2019 and has never been found. Her estranged husband was charged with her murder, but died by suicide before going to trial. Now his girlfriend, Michelle Traconis, stands trial for her alleged role in the disappearance. I think this is going to be a really fascinating case. They've thrown everything up against this defendant. The Missing Mom Conspiracy Trial. Live coverage today, only on Court TV. I'm not going to um, um, set it earlier than that because I don't want any due process issues or appellate issues going up on um, Mrs. Ferreter being pushed unnecessarily to trial prior to her new counsel being able to be ready. So I'm going to set it, special set in uh, July. Give me a, a Friday for large panel jury selection in Friday on, in July. Um, July 12th, Your Honor. Now for what's trending in true crime. A trial date has now been set in the case for boy in a box mom, Tracy Ferreter. On Tuesday, the Honorable Howard Coates, the same judge who oversaw her husband, Tim Ferreter's trial, set Tracy's trial date for July the 12th. Attorney Mark Shiner presented as Ferreter's attorney. This after he had been representing her before, withdrew, apologized for the confusion, told his honor he wants to stay on the case after all. There's Tracy Farreter leaving court yesterday. Tim Farreter convicted back in October. His trial was multiple counts, the worst of which aggravated child abuse. And Tracy's facing the same charges her husband did after prosecutors allege that she went along with that plan of locking their teenage son in that box in the family's garage in Florida. So our question this morning, how will all these extra months, February, March, April, May, June, how will all these extra months help her case? Or will they? Let's bring in our power panel. It is Ladies Day today here on Opening Statements. I have with me criminal defense and civil rights attorney Casia Early, entertainment reporter Kinsey Schofield, and trial attorney Lexi Rigdon. Wonderful to have you all on the show this morning morning. Oh boy, are these extra months going to help Tracy Farreter? Casey Early, you practice in Florida. You've done criminal defense work for many years. Tell us your thoughts on this, please. Yeah, well, the more time, the better. Whenever you're ready, of course, you file that demand for Speedy. But I believe that her defense needs to have a different strategy than Timothy's uh, case in chief. They need to disassociate themselves. And even though she had involvement, there was like a good cop, bad cop thing going on. So make Timothy be that bad cop. And she was just following along. That was her husband. But the least culpability, the better. So she needs to disassociate herself. But bottom line, um, it was a egregious. We, are, we already heard the allegations. She had knowledge and approved uh, intent because there were some things that she did to hide that box that was in the garage from the neighbors and other actions. So she's not going to go off uh, with a not guilty verdict, but maybe uh, be found guilty on less counts. Mm -hmm. You're right, Casey. It was egregious. Pants on fire, Tracy Ferreter. Oh, she's got all these months to prep. Lexi Rigdon, uh, as an attorney, tell me what you might do with Tracy Ferreter. Well, that was actually going to be my comment. All these months to prep. I mean, usually these delays favor the defense because witnesses die, they forget. Um, now, you know, it's a six months or so delay, so it's not huge. But for those six months, I would be prepping her. If she's going to be testifying, I would be going over her testimony. Um, I would be potentially, if there are any other experts to hire, or any other discovery to be done. They've just been granted a, a, a six months that they can continue to work up this case and fix any of the errors that may have happened in her husband's case and kind of do a better job. So this time, this extra time they have to shore up her case is definitely a benefit to the defense and not the state. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, these prosecutors were not happy about that. And even the judge noted he agreed with the state that there wasn't a reason 
reason for such a lengthy delay. Uh, but then he said, but you know what? I don't want this case coming back on appeal. So I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. So if you're a prosecutor, you know, you take the good with the bad. You say, okay, I don't want this case coming back on my desk either. In the meantime, while she may be prepping and the state's office is prepping, uh, Members of the media are not going to stop talking about these parents because, as Casey, you noted, it was egregious. Kinsey Schofield, let me turn to you, please. Uh, your thoughts on the public's perception of this and if any of the heat is going to lessen come July. No, I don't think so, Julie. There is a significant amount of hostility towards Tracy online. There are higher expectations for women. You are expected to be maternal and to pre protect your children from this type of pain and, and trauma. Uh, what trial watchers really want to see from Tracy and what we clearly lacked from Timothy was taking the stand and, and trying to humanize the, these defendants. Uh, how did we get here? Walk us through your th thought process. Did you not get a say? Were you outvoted? Uh, tell us about the adoption process and how you fell in love with your son. Is she likely to garner sympathy from a jury or the public? Who knows? But it would really depend on her performance, obviously. But it might be worth the shot after having a front row seat to her husband's crushing verdict. That's right. Great points, Kinsey. Thank you for that. We're going to stay in Casea, early state of Florida for this next story. We've got to talk about Sarah Boone, right? We were all watching and waiting for her to appear in court. She never did, but she might have picked up a possible win ahead of her pending trial because Tuesday, Tuesday, the court granted her a continuance until May. Now, this is due to the overwhelming workload to prepare for trial. Boone not in the courtroom, never brought over, uh, but the motion was filed with the court before the MLK holiday. Now, Boone is charged with second-degree murder of her boyfriend, Jorge Torres. Prosecutors allege she zipped him up in a suitcase and left him to die. Now, she's had a lot of trouble keeping an attorney during the pretrial process. As we know, I think this might be attorney number six or seven. I've lost count, quite frankly. And we're wondering this morning here at Court TV, is Sarah Boone going to end up defending herself at trial? Let's bring our power panel of ladies back in and see what they think. Casey Early, start us off, please. You think she's going to go pro se eventually? Well, before she goes pro se, maybe there needs to be a mental evaluation um, because that's too many attorneys to go through. And my issue with this is I, I, I've been uh, hired after several attorneys were uh, withdrawn from a case. And oftentimes there's a disagreement with the theory of defense. We see overwhelming actual and circumstantial evidence and they're just delusional. They don't see what we see and they disagree. And, and in fact, that's their right. But before she does go pro se, which may likely be, there needs to be a mental evaluation because uh, there's actual evidence in this case that she created. And here in Florida, uh, voluntary intoxication is not a defense. So she really needs to know the law in order to have uh, due process. That's right. Uh, Casey, thank you for that. Uh, let's play a clip of where she's on body camera footage describing the incident and essentially saying she fell asleep before calling 911. The problem is, is that I fell asleep. I fell asleep. When did you do CPR? This morning, when I found it. Before you called? Yes! <laughs> it's one o'clock right now. I tried, I was awake, but I actually got out of the bed at like 12.30ish, whatever. So I came downstairs you, and I was like, oh, he's in the suitcase still. Oh boy, okay, time out, right? Lexi Rigdon, let me go to you here. You know, we know she was taunting him before she took that nap, right? Your thoughts, please. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that to the extent that she asked to represent herself, I think the judge would be crazy to allow her to do so given the seriousness of the charges and that I'm sure that would also be an issue for appeal even if the judge let her do it. And competency to represent yourself is different than competency to stand trial. A judge would have to evaluate her, her educational background and her understanding of the proceedings. And you just have to wonder what's going on behind the scenes because you are not guaranteed a good rapport with your defense attorney. And so the fact that so many attorneys are successfully withdrawing makes me wonder if it indeed is an issue over the defense strategy or something other than her being a nightmare of a client, which she probably is. But I think that the court would be making a grave mistake if it allowed her to represent herself in a case this serious. Lexi, thank you.
I think that Sarah Boone is trying to be like a jailhouse lawyer. I really do. The letters, she thinks she's special going right to the judge. Uh, I like what you said there, Lex, about her being a nightmare of a client. Definitely think so. I think this woman thinks she knows better than these attorneys. And I think they're probably like thrilled. Let, goodbye. You let me you know, wash my hands of you when they get uh, the permission from the court to withdraw. She's a mess. Uh, I want to play the clip that uh, this is the one seen around the world. Uh, this is so angering. You know what I'm going to play this is the the cell phone video the evidence she created that these prosecutors are going to use to nail her uh, and, and you can hear uh, poor Jorge Torres in that suitcase pleading for help let's take a listen together now Sarah this is my name don't wear it up Sarah I can't breathe babe Sarah is he yeah that's when you do when you choke me Sarah Oh my, uh, and, and we know then after that, she claims she fell asleep, took a nap, she acts all panicked. Kinsey Schofield, tell me, uh, when we think about the public sentiment with this one, oh my, I know you're well aware, it is fierce. Uh, we get asked about this case all the time uh, on Court TV, when she's gonna go to trial. People really wanna see justice. Uh, tell me, how do you think these videos are really gonna play in with the public perception and the jury's perception, the, the fact finders, when the time comes? please. I mean, it reminds me of Jody Arias. The public interest is insane. And I do think that people, uh, you know, are incredibly hostile towards Sarah Boone. She's a complicated character and all eyes will be glued to this trial. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we will see what happens when she reports to court uh, this spring. Again, that'll be her next date. Uh, we know she's got that continuance and uh, that'll be until May. So we'll, we'll see if she shows up uh, next time or if they transport her over. It seems to be that it was unnecessary yesterday. That's why we didn't see her. All right, big thanks to Lexi Rigdon for joining us. Lexi, we'll let you go. Have a wonderful day. Kasia and Kinsey are going to stay with us as we head into our spotlight. Here's what we have next. Next for you, my friends, investigators are saying that evidence taken from an energy drink belonging to Rex Hurman's daughter is what ultimately led to the charging of Rex Hurman for victim number four, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, in what's become known as the Gilgo Four. And still to come, will this Facebook photo, I mean, look at this, of a victim and the defendant Tip the scales of justice in the Treehouse murder trial. Did a contentious divorce lead to a killing? Jennifer Dulos vanished in 2019 and has never been found. Her estranged husband was charged with her murder, but died by suicide before going to trial. Now his girlfriend, Michelle Traconis, stands trial for her alleged role in the disappearance. I think this is going to be a really fascinating case. They've thrown everything up against this defendant. The Missing Mom Conspiracy Trial. Live coverage today, only on Court TV. Welcome back to Opening Statements. I'm Julie Grant. This morning, we are spotlighting the incredible forensic work that led to the latest murder charge in the Gilgo Beach serial killings. Rex Hurman has now been officially charged with the murder of 25-year-old Maureen Brainerd Barnes. She is one of the so-called Gilgo Four. Like the other victims, Brainerd Barnes was a sex worker when she was mysteriously killed years ago, and investigators linked DNA from a single hair found on her body to a DNA sample they got from Hurman's daughter. They took it off of a monster energy drink. On Tuesday, prosecutors and Hurman's attorneys spoke about nuclear DNA allegedly linking him to the fourth victim. We now have nuclear DNA profiles on all five of the questioned hairs. We use this using uh, the, the SNP or SNP process. And with regard uh, to the, uh, the hair found in, uh, on uh, Maureen Brainer Barnes on that belt buckle, uh, it was uh, 7.9 trillion times more likely to have come from someone with the identical genetic profile as Asa Ellerup. Uh, with regard to the, the first hair that we got, the mitochondrial DNA profile on the female hair on Megan Waterman. Uh, that is uh, 2.374 times 10 to the 48th power as likely to have come from someone matching the genetic profile of Acer Ellera. And the way that that number is, is uh, 
is expressed. That's a scientific uh, expression, I'm told. So that's basically 2.374, and you add 48 zeros to that. So that's a number so large it doesn't even exist. Uh, you know, a name for it doesn't even exist. Uh, with regard to the second hair that was found on, on the tape uh, by the head of Maureen, uh, of Megan Waterman, uh, that was also consistent with a, a person with the same genetic profile as Asa Ellerup, and that was um, uh, 2.778 times 10 to the 488th uh, power uh, could, could exclude the rest of the population. Uh, with regard to the male hair, that again, that was the we received the mitochondrial uh, DNA profile with regard to that. The nuclear DNA profile on that was um, uh, 1.48 times 10 to the 169th power as to, to come from someone sharing the same genetic profile as uh, the defendant. This has been a 13 plus year investigation. And we have been told, and you folks have covered this, that there is no nuclear DNA available. And in fact, it's unsuitable for, for DNA testing on the nuclear level. We have been told it's mitochondrial uh, testing and, and there have been results. Those results are not very convincing. Today for the first time is we hear about nuclear DNA. We're gonna look into that. We are certainly gonna look into the lab reports, the lab testing, and the transfer of evidence, because that, that's somewhat disturbing to learn for the first time after 13 years that we now have nuclear DNA testing. Wow, Michael G. Brown has a point, because in, in 2010, when that hair was recovered, we didn't have the ability to do that testing, but now the science has caught up, and now the testing has happened. Is this fair? Let's bring in our guest. I still have with me attorney Casey Early and entertainment reporter Kinsey Schofield. Uh, Casey, tell me, looking at this from the defense perspective, is this legally fair? Well, listen, the only way to uh, fight this case is the battle of the experts. If you believe as a defense that the state's expert uh, was not qualified or, or this science is not as advanced and tested enough, then you bring your expert to kind of break that down to the jury. Because if you don't have anything to combat this information, the jury is going to hold on to what the state's witness or state's expert is testifying about this DNA. So. This is the time to get your uh, DNA expert on the defense to explain it away because with advancement of technology, the cell site data, as well as this DNA, this could seal the, the fate of uh, Rex Hume. Yeah, it really could. Uh, you're right, Casey. This, this is bad. Uh, this was not a good day for the defense, certainly. We know Michael J. Brown is an incredible attorney. He's going to know what to do. I'm sure he's already got the ball in motion doing exactly what you're saying, Casey, or calling their own independent experts to test, retest, try to verify, see if they can debunk anything uh, to protect his client's interests. He made it very clear to the public that Rex Hurman, once hearing about this fourth charge, uh, said he's innocent, uh, looking forward to his day in court, looking forward to defending these charges. We know the court of public opinion is something else when we want to see people getting justice. And we know 11 people dead on that beach. Here we've only got charges pertaining to four victims. Certainly that's better than no charges, but it's not enough. Uh, Kinsey Schofield, tell me please, uh, in your opinion, uh, where does the public sentiment stand on testing like this, advancements like this, in order to get justice for the victims of these heinous crimes? Well, as you know, I'm located in Hollywood, Los Angeles, California, where these you know, potential jurors are watching shows like CSI or these documentaries where over, you know, just over a matter of seconds, everything's painted so clearly for them. I think that uh, normal people love the idea of tangible evidence, whether that is DNA or being able to look at someone's history, for instance, Rex or somebody utilizing Rex's computer, searching for the, the names of these go-go beach victims over 200 times. It's become almost, I would say, there are unrealistic expectations painted by Hollywood these days uh, when potential jurors sit down and actually work a trial like this. And I think in the state's case, it's almost a slam dunk because assuming that people have expectations, CSI type expectations, there is so much of that evidence here. 
between burner phones, internet history, hard drives, and now DNA. Uh, I think the case, uh, the, the state is likely very confident about this case. And, and trial watchers, they eat this stuff up because this is the evidence that they've become accustomed to. Kinsey, you are spot on, my friend. I'm so glad you brought that up. There is scholarly research out there that calls it the CSI effect. Exactly what you're talking about, about how we love those shows. They're great. You know, the crime dramas, they're fantastic to watch. I enjoy them myself. And I also keep in mind, you know, watching them, I'm like, oh, there's no way this would be tried in an hour and we'd get to this. You know, it, it's part of the fiction, part of what we love about Hollywood, where you are. And so, yes, it is something that attorneys have to combat, especially prosecutors, you know, when it comes time to let people know, hey, not every case is going to have DNA evidence, hairs, fibers, all those things. So uh, hopefully the public will be very patient with the task force as they continue their work. We've got to leave it there for now, but such a pleasure having you on the show. Kinsey Schofield, thank you for waking up early for us on the West Coast. Uh, we'll see you very soon. And Casey is going to stay with us. And when we come back, we're going to talk about what is tipping the scales. Have you seen the photograph of the defendant in the Treehouse murder trial posing with the victim? Now, don't let the smiles fool you because his next witness is in dire health and she's the state's victim in this case. What is going on here? Why are they together? We're going to talk about it next. Tonight on Court TV. These are the big cases that everyone is talking about. A lot of new developments taking place. Shocking. I know who killed John Bonet, to say the least. You cannot make this stuff up. It's uh, unreal. The scene of the double murders is behind us right here. Things are happening. The investigation is continuing. Closing arguments with Vinny Politan tonight at 8, 7 central, only on your TV. Two people came bowing up the stairs. One jumped on me immediately, slit my neck, telling me that if I didn't give him the money, he was going to kill me. Now to what could be tipping the scales in the Treehouse murder trial. None of the survivors seem to be pointing the finger at the defendant. And one of the victims even went so far as to take a photo with him. It was posted to Facebook. Look at this. This is Paula Belmont in the hospital bed posing for the picture with the defendant with Franklin Ty Tucker. This happened over the weekend. Now remember, her throat was slashed in this attack where Tucker is accused. And Tucker says he plans to call Belmont as one of the witnesses. Prosecutors objected to calling her out of order. They said that the Facebook photo makes it seem like she can wait a few days. He was trying to say that her health was so bad she needed to be called during the state's case. So. What about this photo? And what about Paula Belmont's testimony? What's going to happen? Is it going to tip the scales of justice in Tucker's favor? Let's bring in our guest, criminal defense attorney and civil rights attorney, Casey Early, still with us on the show. Casey, what do you think, please? Julie, I want to say that this would tip the scales in favor of the defendant in this case, but there's also a saying that if you represent yourself, you have a fool for a client. So although he may have a great case, I mean, granted, this is every defendant's or attorney's dream is to have the victim advocating for the defendant. However, there's rules of evidence. You have to know how to try a case. You just can't have a photo, which is a great photo, by the way. But you have to lay the proper foundation to get it into evidence. So, you know, although the judge is giving him a little leeway, at the same time, the judge has to be fair. And if you decide to represent yourself, you better know not only the rules of evidence, the proper courtroom procedures, but also the proper objections. So, you know, it, this is a case that can go either way simply because he does not have a legal advocate that's educated in the law. Mm -hmm. Right, Casey. You know, and he went on Michael Ayala's show yesterday. By the way, the clip's up on CourtTV.com if anybody wants to watch it. He gave an interview in the middle of the trial. And I'm thinking, oh my that. goodness, and he's getting away with it. 
I saw that, you know, that's a no-no. You do not give an interview in the middle of a trial. You wait until the end. So that just shows you that he's not educated in the proper form. And, you know, that can go against him. So I, when I saw that, I was like, no, 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 not yet. Take but, hey, you can't stop him. He's representing <laughs> himself pro se. I wish him all the best. No, that's right. Oh, Casey Early, we love having you on opening statements. Thank you so much for everything this morning. We'll let you get off to court and get your day started. And that is all for this this episode of Opening Statements, friends, you can watch it or share it if you like. We've got the episodes on CourtTV.com now. Maybe you've heard, maybe you haven't. Uh, if you haven't heard, you just click on the Shows tab. That's how you get them. You can watch them, share them. 